Um, our second speaker is David Tillman. Uh, David is Regents Professor and McKnight Presidential Chair in Ecology at the University of Minnesota, uh, where his current research is centered on pursuing ways to preserve the world's biodiversity, slow the rate of climate change, and still meet human needs for food and energy. Take care of it all. <laughs> um, David has been recognized and awarded for his landmark contributions to ecosystem science in the US and abroad. David? Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. And I am maybe the odd duck among all of you, but I've the advantage of that I've been learning a lot from the talks so far. They've been fabulous, uh, all of them. Um, well, I want to uh, look at some of these links. This is, I see why people don't know what to do with this machine here. We'll see what that button does. Oh. oh, thank you. Perfect. Thanks, Jess. Jess rescued me. So we know, you all know about uh, the WHO's analyses of, of disease burden that come out every, every year or so. Um, and we know that the nutrition transition, this change in, in human diets around the world is highly associated with, uh, with um, the declining health, especially for non-communicable diseases. And uh, you probably know, but maybe not as much as I'm going to show you, about the other side of this, which are the environmental impacts of these changing diets. 30% of global greenhouse gas emissions come from agricultural food production, uh, crops and livestock. Um, Agriculture is a major cause of pollution of, of waters, lakes, oceans. Think dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, dead zone at the end of every single river that drains an agricultural area around the world, as well as uh, groundwater pollution, which affects drinking water quality, as, does surf as do surface waters. Agriculture is the major threat of extinction for species on Earth. Um, Agriculture also causes significant harm to people who are downwind of fertilized agricultural fields from production of PM 2.5. And what we have now, which is probably also true if you look at the um, Global Burden of Disease Report, uh, is only an indication of much worse things that are likely to come if we continue on our current trajectory. So you've all see th seen things like this, um, different foods, um, and then the impact of that food here for greenhouse gases, uh, but lots of the work was started just on greenhouse gas, now go out, as I'll show you, and as Marco will really show you, I think, later on, to many other dimensions besides just greenhouse gas. And I want to mention the other dimensions in the, today's talk as well as greenhouse gas, because there really are other major environmental problems in the world besides climate change. Climate change is one. Many ecologists would assert that it has co-equal partners in terms of eutrophication and extinction, in terms of the long-term sustainability of, of uh, the support systems upon which humanity depends on Earth. So this is pretty clear. Um, you'll see the plant-based uh, products shown here, maize, wheat, et cetera, have very, relatively low greenhouse gas emissions here per kilocalorie, but the same is true per serving, um, whatever serving might be. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, also uh, per gram of protein for those foods that have protein. And, uh, and we know that different diets, the alternative diets that I, I sort of showed you there, uh, vegetarian diets being pushed far over to the left-hand side of the last graph, and then going from that to pescatarian, adding fish, Mediterranean, adding some red meats, and a typical westernized diet with uh, much more of the red meat, as we've already seen, excess consumption uh, of, of red meats. Uh, these different diets have different health impacts. And again, I'm not the expert. I'm just showing you your own data if you're a nutritionist back at you. Um, but these are reductions in um, diabetes, cancers, uh, heart disease, and mortality from it, and all-cause mortality associated with alternative diets. So diet and health are very definitely linked. Um, here are what these alternative diets do just to per capita emissions of greenhouse gases. Again, no real surprise, diets that are pushed over on that diagram of different food types and the greenhouse gas emission further to uh, the left have lower greenhouse gas emissions. And adoption of these diets uh, uh, around the world could have huge implications. The line here of zero in this graph are current emissions. So this shows how uh, current emissions of greenhouse gases from agriculture, how they might change uh, uh, in the 49 year period uh, shown here um, in response to current dietary trends where increasing incomes around the world, increased urbanization uh, are, are leading to dietary shifts toward more calories, more meat, more empty calories, and so on, with all the health implications, 
Well, here's what would happen. We would have an increase of about two gigatons of CO2 C equivalent emissions per year. That is uh, a little bit more than all transportation currently emits around the world. So we would basically have food um, doubling current transportation emissions at the same time that we're trying, we're worrying about what cars are doing. And we're not worrying at all as much on the climate change community about what food is doing. But if we, if people adopted a Mediterranean, pescatarian, or vegetarian diets, we could have much lower, in fact, some, in some cases, lower emissions in 2050 from uh, agricultural food production than we have right now uh, from it. So their diet can be a big lever. Um, I'm going to, to point out diet is one big lever, but it's not the only necessary lever to address the sustainability issue. Um, so air and water pollution are, are both uh, uh, greatly impacted by agriculture. Nitrogen uh, pollution of, of, of surface waters, lakes, rivers, and streams, as I, as I said, is a, is a really big factor, uh, as well as its PM 2.5 production. Uh, and if you look at where diets are going, how food is being produced, the lowest number that I've seen uh, describing how these environmental impacts of, of eutrophication and so on from agriculture might change uh, the next 50 years is a 70% increase. There are estimates of 100%, 110, 150. I think the highest I know is 210, which was my own number. Um, so maybe I'm a nattering nabob of negativism. Um, <laughs> no, I'm a dismal scientist like the economists. Um, so, um, so what are solutions to the eutrophication problem? Well, diets are one of them. Um, and uh, the other has to do with how we grow crops and the efficiency with which we apply uh, fertilizers, where we grow crops, and so on. And there's lots of research done on all of these, and we'll hear some more talks on these later in this meeting. But on the, on the health side, um, here I've taken the greenhouse gas numbers I showed you before. I sort of laid these on its side, maybe a bit, uh, for the y-axis, I apologize. Um, and you can see just as greenhouse gas emissions uh, per kilocalorie of food uh, increase going from the left to the right hand side from plant to animal based foods, so too does the eutrophication caused by those foods. And we think about maize, which is there, having a really high eutrophication effect. We grow corn in the US and all the leftover nutrients from corn drain down the Mississippi River and cause the dead zone. That's nothing compared to beef. In fact, it takes about 15 kilograms of maize protein to make one kilogram of edible beef protein, which is why this number is so much higher up there than it is down there. And so it's no surprise that I, I didn't, I'm not going to show you them that way, but the graph like I showed you for how different diets influence greenhouse gas, the same parallel numbers show different diets influence eutrophication. I'll show it to you in a slightly different way here. Um, this is eutrophication impact. Um, here. Uh, it's on a log scale, you might notice, graphed against uh, the mortality risk and changes in mortality risk associated with an added uh, serving per day of various food types. Um, and the food types are listed there. And what you can see is that for these types of foods, and these are basically not processed foods. Processed foods, as Adam pointed out, are a whole different story. Um, but for these unprocessed foods, basically diets that are shifted toward uh, having lower mortality risk or toward having a lower incidence of diabetes, stroke, and heart disease in the bottom graph, where I just sort of lumped data for all three of those here. Uh, one added daily serving has these health benefits or costs, and it has these eutrophication impacts. You'll notice that a linear change in the health impacts is associated with basically an exponential change in the environmental impacts. Um, a diet that fell from, let's say, a mortality risk of 1.5 down to a mortality risk of, of uh, 0.85, going down by 0.3, would have a hundredfold decrease on average uh, in the eutrophication impact associated with it. So there is this, uh, what are, for all of us personally, huge health impacts have even huger environmental uh, impacts going either up or down these curves. It's really a log linear relationship. And that's a very important feature of these in terms of, of how slight changes in diet can have big implications for the environment. So there's been an immense amount of research, I'll just mention, but I'm sure we'll see some more detail on this later on, about how yields can be uh, retained uh, by, add, by using the right amount of an input like fertilizer, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, or irrigation at the right time for a crop. And on, in general, they show we need about 20 to 30% less input 
if we do, uh, do agriculture in a more precise way. And it's often thought when I say something like this that this will cause lower yield. So I'll just show you some empirical evidence to the contrary. Each point here is the average yield of total crop production expressed here in terms of tons of protein produced per hectare per year in each of these countries. And it's for a given year, the years start on the left-hand side of the graph, 1960, and they work their way up to uh, 2009. And what you can see is as nitrogen use intensity, fertilization rate went up in France or Mexico or Germany or Italy, so too did the yield of food per hectare up until around 1990 when these took a different trajectory and then we have yields to continue going up in these countries with either the same or less and fertilizer being applied. Um, the normal explanation for this was uh, a law in the EU, the EU nitrate directive which made farmers have to justify how much fertilizer they bought um, and get a permit to buy it and in Mexico the lack, uh, the, the declining price supports for fertilizer which made farmers um, act in their own economic self-interest. But in both cases, there is more food with less input, 20 or so percent more food in these cases with 20 or so percent less input. So now I want to get on to another issue, extinction, and the impacts of extinction uh, that are related to diet. Um, and clearly extinction is a big part of the health of the organisms that are going extinct. Well, in the IUCN's analyses of, uh, of 75,000 different species around the world and what uh, their status is as far as their chance of going extinct, um, what they found is the single greatest factor that threatens species with extinction is land clearing. And this is particularly land clearing for agriculture. The next biggest fact factor is logging, again, another kind of land clearing. And the vast majority of lands that are logged in the tropical countries of the world where this is mainly happening uh, go from deforested land to pasture to cropland. So they act eventually do become cropland. And the third biggest ones of all of these is just direct hunting for food. People in Kenya mentioned who don't only get goat once a month uh, also are motivated to go out and hunt as people do all, have, have done traditionally all around the world and what they hunt are organisms that can be pushed toward extinction because of, of that process. So it is a threat of extinction. So this is a, a map, a shaded map, just showing sort of looking at one group of organisms, large mammals, uh, where they are, uh, number of species in the upper graph, how many species of mammals there are. The two centers of remaining mammal diversity on Earth are uh, the southern part of Asia, tropical Asia, and tropical Africa. And uh, the risks they currently face show that 65, and in some cases, 80% of all the large animals, the largest and that big, it's bigger than about a small dog, 10 kilograms and up, uh, are threatened with extinction in many of the Asian countries uh, and, and in uh, South America. Uh, and uh, the area that has as many uh, large mammals in it still, Sub-Saharan Africa, has actually very low risk compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but uh, we have a world that is growing. We expect to add, according to the UN, about 1.7 billion people to Sub-Saharan Africa in the next 50 years. Massive increase in population. Sub-Saharan Africa also is an area with rapidly growing uh, economies. Uh, when people are richer, they purchase and bring into their homes and to a great extent consume more food. Here is calories, uh, each dot is a year uh, for uh, a, a one of the world regions. Um, starting in 1960 going up to 2014, I believe. Um, and you can see for each of these regions of the world, there's a very good relationship between um, inflation just per capita GDP, a crude measure of income, and how many calories a typical person brings into their house um, per day. And incomes are going up. So multiply sort of where the world is moving up this curve, demanding more and more calories. To produce these calories, because a lot of these calories are meat, um, uh, requires lots of grain for poultry and so on, about four kilograms of pro grain protein to give you one kilogram of edible uh, 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 poultry. And for beef, I said it's around 15 as a ratio. And so if you actually ask how many calories of crops have to be grown per person per year, the asymptote for that is around 8,000 calories of crops grown for the richest people in the world to give them the 3,500 calories of food they bring to their house to give them the 2,500 or 3,000 calories they actually eat. 
Well, the net effect of this um, is that because of these forces, increasing population and this dietary shift toward more calories and calories that are much more, require much more crops to, for them to produce, meat calories, uh, there are a variety of estimates. Uh, ours range from about 70% to 100% increase in global food production over the next 50 years uh, will be needed. So although we may only have 30% more people, we basically have many of the environmental problems and associated with them the health problems from this, from this nutrition transition that may well, in some sense, double approximately uh, in the next 50 or so years. So here we, had, we looked at this uh, demand for food and then translated it into demand for land and land clearing for all the countries of the world and focused on the three areas here uh, where uh, there are still remaining relatively high diversity of large animals. And the current extinction risks are shown in the first sort of uh, mice. The colors are quite different on this screen than on that. Interesting. I didn't understand what Jess was saying, but I know what's going on. So the light blue and dark blue bars, um, extinction risks for Asia are about, are, are going to double. They're already massively high, they told you. Uh, Sub-Saharan Africa has low current extinction risks. They're going to become higher than current Asian risks. And, so, and South America is going to have a, also a marked increase in, in extinction risk because of food, basically. It's, this is driven by land clearing to grow food that these people want to have, to have diets like the rest of the world has. The good news is diet can help prevent some of this. This is the amount of land that could be prevented from uh, destruction, from being converted from natural ecosystems in these tropical habitats uh, into cropland if people changed, adopted different diets than the diets that they are tending toward in their, in their current system. So adopting Mediterranean, pescatarian, vegetarian diets can save, oh, 600 or so million hectares of land. That's two-thirds the size of the United States that wouldn't be cleared with those dietary shifts. So that is a, does have a major biodiversity benefit, preventing extinction. But if you actually try to look at this at other factors which, are, which could be changed, it turns out the most powerful thing, I, and this is to all my economic friends, I must bow and say trade. Trade uh, that would be biased in a way such that pe nations with the highest or higher yields in the crop would mainly export those crops to nations with much lower yields, sort of using the comparative advantage of yield among nations that exist uh, already around the world, uh, can prevent a lot more land clearing than merely dietary shifts. The dietary shifts are the upper, lighter uh, bars. The middle bars are the effects of, of that kind of, uh, of trade. And then the lower bars um, are um, uh, the effects of increasing yields in currently low-yielding nations. So here's, to me, what I think is a, is a nice sort of summary graph that links together um, uh, many of the points that I've been, uh, been making and that we're talking about. This again, again goes back to studies of the effects of an added serving of a given food type uh, linked with the effects of a, of a serving on the environment. And here, this is looking first just uh, in the, in the uh, left-hand figure at the relative risk of mortality associated with each of these different food types. Uh, and uh, that's on a linear scale, as I showed you before. And this is the average environmental impact across four different things, greenhouse gases, eutrophication, irrigation water use, and land clearing. And um, what I would say that might, uh, it doesn't negate what you said, Adam, uh, but if you look across these sort of foods that are mainly whole foods from plants uh, and animals, there's a pretty tight relationship. I think it's pretty tight, and this is it's a log linear relationship, uh, a relatively small uh, dietary shift that has a, a health benefit can have a, a really large environmental benefit. The outlier shown here, and I don't have data for other things, so foods, sugar-sweetened beverages, uh, there's some data on them and their health and environmental impacts. Foods that are not sugar-sweetened beverages, but which have added sugars in them, also have negative health impacts and they have relatively low environmental impacts. I think we've added other kinds of starchy processed foods with trans fats and so on that all be here in terms of having a high health risk with a pretty low environmental impact. So there are these sort of mass-produced foods that are becoming more and more common around the world that offer environmental benefits but really no uh, but, but massive health harm. Uh, and outside of them, uh, sort of the group of, of foods that are not so processed and manufactured 
uh, show a fairly straight uh, trade-off among them. And these trade-offs um, are really there when you look at all possible combinations of these four different health impacts, mortality, heart disease, diabetes, and stroke.